Is what's funny is we've we've done interviews for a few of your other projects, mm -hmm. and every time I interviewed him, I would always say, "Let's talk about the Queen movie. Let's talk about Bohemian Rhapsody." And you always be like, D "We're working on it down the road. We'll talk about it, you know, at some point." And yet here we finally are. Um, uh, uh, as a longtime Queen fan, I want to say uh, how, how how much I enjoyed this movie. Um, and one of the main reasons, listen, everyone in this movie is great, but uh, I have to give special mention to Rami Malek because without him as Freddie. You know the the film can't work. Um, so talk a little bit about how did you know Rami was the person, and talk a little bit about those initial meetings and when did you know that he was the guy? I think uh, about two and a half years ago, um, this guy that worked with me, Jennifer Sullivan, in my office again. I was in London shooting a film, and he called me up and he said, "I think I found out Freddie." And I said, "Who's that?" He said, "This guy Rami Malek in Mr. Robot." And I said, "Oh, where's Rami from?" He went, "Sherman Oaks." <laughs> he said, okay. He said, but you should come over and meet with him. So five days later, I flew from London to LA, went to my office in Santa Monica, and Rami walked in on a Sunday evening. And we spent five hours together. And he was nervous. I was excited. And Dennis was nervous, so I didn't waste a trip. And um, we just spoke a lot about film. We spoke about life. And you could tell right then that there was something inside of him that was very kind of Freddy. And he wasn't putting it on. He wasn't trying to act. He wasn't trying to audition. He was just being Rami. And um, we w I walked out after that five-hour meeting, and I said to this guy, Dennis, I said, you know, I'm still not sure. Maybe he needs to put himself on tape um, as Freddy, and let's see that and let's see how it looks. I went back to London the following morning. Three days later, I get an email, and it's Rami put himself on an iPhone uh, being Freddie and doing an interview that he saw on YouTube as Freddie Mercury. <coughs> and I watched that, and I just said, we found Freddie. I mean, it was unbelievable. It was a lot like you see now. And, you know, there was a lot of talk in the past about other people playing Freddie Mercury. There was never anyone signed to play Freddie Mercury officially. Um, Rami was the first and the only one. And... Um, it was such a huge relief because that was always the worry, is who's going to play Freddie Mercury. And, um, you know, he just dived into this. He took himself off to London, didn't wait to have a green light from a studio. We had no studio who wanted to make the movie. I was going from studio to studio. No one really believed in it. And he took himself off to London and started working with um, a chore choreographer and a dance coach and an instructor and and. and, and diving into that role, and it was unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. Uh, did he meet with uh, Brian and Roger and like? Yes, I, I took him over. Yeah, I took him over at first and introduced him to Brian and Roger. They were absolutely floored. He was so <laughs> nervous going into that meeting, and they were just staring at him like this. <laughs> and Rami felt very uncomfortable. But then Brian turned around and said, let's do some photos together, Freddy, like that. And that was it. That kind of broke the ice. And, and they were as blown away as I was. Uh, one of the sequences that's incredible in the film is the Live Aid set. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just has this, uh, I was fortunate enough to attend uh, the world premiere in London. And there were 7,000 people in that theater. And it felt like a concert in there. People were like clapping. It was, it was a, I've never experienced anything like that. Um, and I think you can feel that energy in here. You guys all saw it tonight. Like it has this amazing energy. Um, talk a little bit about filming that, uh, and you know the challenge of because, you know, the film ends with Live Aid. You know, minor spoiler, uh, but it, it you know you walk out with this crazy energy. Right. You know, well, I, I we, the film was always bookended by Live Aid, and again there was a lot of press in the past talking about how. Um, there were screenplays where Freddie died halfway through the movie and the rest was Queen. And that was, again, I never saw that kind of screenplay. But um, it was always about that that 20 minute performance they did at Live Aid, which was so iconic and just um, um, an integral part of our film. And um <laughs> it had to be the first week of shooting, which the actors, you know, as you can imagine, love that their first week of shooting this film was Live Aid, the Live Aid performance. But I got to tell you, I, I, we, we built the stage to spec um, in an airstrip in North London. And because uh, Wembley's not Wembley anymore, Wembley's been rebuilt, a completely different stadium. And we put 2,500, 3,000 extras in there. And 
just to see these guys, I've never gotten emotional over a film I'm doing because you get so into the work and into the stress and pressure of producing films that you never really step back. And when I walked on that Live Aid stage and watched them rehearse, I literally just broke down and thought, here we are, we're actually doing this. And just to see how they were rehearsing and got on every single move down, every single guitar leg. I mean, these guys became these musicians. And it tra just transformed me by watching it. So we did a song a day. That was the deal. And then at the end of, I think, six days, the guy said, how about we do the whole set? Because the actual set, if you go home and watch it on YouTube, it's got Crazy Little Thing and We Will Rock You. And then because we had already used those in the film, we didn't obviously didn't want to repeat them. But they did the whole set over a two-day period. And it, again, it was unbelievable. What takes did you end up using in the movie? Do you remember? Was it from those final two days? Or was it from those each days? There was some from each day. There, there was some from each day. And Tom Siegel, our DP, was just magnificent of, of capturing the, the band the way he did. Because we were trying to build the story with the audience as well, knowing that we're going to CGI a lot of audience in. And then we had the Bob Geldof moment and the Mike Myers moment. So we'd already placed like cards into that. But it was it was it took a lot of takes and a lot of different angles for us to you know, when you're doing a live concert, you have to keep the audience engaged. Right? And, you know, I remember Scorsese shooting Shine a Light and I was there and he used thirteen cameras on that stage with Rolling Stones. So it was about Tom keeping us engaged, using the angles and using the shots, and then, as I say, the interaction with the audience. Uh, at what point did you find out that Rami was allergic to cats? <laughs> <laughs> and how, and because Two days ago. No, I'm <laughs> kidding. <laughs> um, he did tell me that. It was okay. It was okay. We dealt with that. But um, <laughs> I've, you know, I've managed, as you know, I've worked with some of the greatest you know, I've worked with Daniel Day-Lewis twice and some of the greatest actors, and I, I've never seen a performance like this. I mean, to where you just dive in and take that role. And to have the real guys there, and, you know, Brian May, who, you know, I completely bluffed, because I don't think he felt the film would ever get made, because there were so many stops and starts, um, turned into, well, I'm going to stay away to I want to come every day. Which was really tough. I mean, the first day of shooting Live Aid, Willem, who plays Brian, is back stage backstage live aid about ready to go on the stage and brian may just went hang on a minute back to his wig literally <laughs> turned like this and i went oh jesus and i took brian may aside and i said i told him the story about when we we did the ali movie and how when muhammad ali came to set will smith's like i'm not coming out of my trailer if he's here you know it's very tough when the real guys are standing there so i had to like <laughs> brian and i got into the biggest conflict we had through a, the whole process of 10 years was me telling him he can't come to set every day. <laughs> so it's pretty crazy. So was it every other day, every third? <laughs> he tried. He tried. I was getting these emails, and he would call me up, and then other people would call me up on his behalf, and he said, I feel really offended that I can't be there. And I said, you don't understand. you know. <laughs> but he was so amazing in other ways. Again, while we were shooting Live Aid, I was showing him costume fittings of other scenes, and he said, you know, he would look at Gwillem's um, costume. He said, you know, that's not that good. I've got better at home, the original. <laughs> and so we sent a truck to his house, and he gave us all his original clothing, which would have more. So he got that invested in it. So it was great in one way. In another way, I just needed the actors to be able to act and not think that the real guy standing right there. It's really tough. No, that makes complete sense, actually. I don't think if I was portraying someone, I could walk out and have them watching me and judging yeah. me. You know, um, I'm always curious about the editing process because that's ultimately the final rewrite. So um, talk a little bit about what you learned in the test screening process that impacted the finished film. Well, the biggest thing for me was, was the cards at the end because we never had cards at the end. And I don't usually, when I made Avi the Howard Hughes story with Aviator and you know, um, uh, even the Ali story, we never put cards at the end. I always felt they were a little bit TV movie sometimes when you put the cards up. And the everywhere we previewed the film, the audience was saying they wanted to know more. What happened with Jim Hutton? How about his relationship with Mary? And blah, blah, blah. So, so we landed up putting these cards up, which I think worked really well. Because we found, right at the end, we found the acapella version of Don't Stop Me Now. Because I always wanted to hear Freddie's voice at the end and not Paulie's. Just solo Freddie. And we found that right very late in the process, actually, and put that on. Um, but that was one. Of, that was one of the biggest things we got. But we we were testing. I mean, it's a 
the highest test scores I've ever had for any of my movies, even at an early stage. We went to Chicago and did a um, blind street and cruise, which obviously means they don't know what they're going to see till you're really pitched in the film. And we scored 96. And this is exactly the movie that I set out to make. I didn't set out to make an R-rated dark version of a um, rock and roll front man doing drugs and partying. I feel that's cliche and we've seen that. I wanted to celebrate their music and celebrate Freddie's life and have it become a crowd pleaser. And I was sensing that when I was going to theaters and we were previewing the film with 300 people. You could feel it in the room. Um, so, um, as I say, the biggest thing was the cards. And then, you know, we, we had some other things in the film that just felt a little repetitive or slowed the pacing down. So we changed that. It's a normal process, as you know, as you go through. But John Ottman did an amazing job editing this movie. Yeah, John's a talented editor. Yes, he is. Uh, what was the last scene to come out before the f the finished version? Because I know I know some of those deleted scenes, and I'm just curious, what was the last thing that came, you know, that almost made it in the movie? Do you remember? <laughs> Um, well, we cut Live Aid down a little bit. Um, I think that actually the actual last editing we did is we took a verse out of Radio Gaga. Because it's only one verse now. It's one main verse, and then we go to the chorus where we have the chorus to play. Um, so that was the last thing we ever we dealt with. Scene-wise, I'm trying to remember what was the last thing we took out. While you're thinking about that, I want to ask these guys, does he need to hold the mic closer for audio, or is it, are we good? Okay. I'm good. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm just trying to, I'm just, that hey was, yo. Right. <laughs> 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 that's great. <laughs> um, so what was the last, do you remember what the last scene was? I don't, oh God. <laughs> no, it's fine. This I'm just whole movie is like a hazy <laughs> no I'm, I'm i'm just um, i'm just curious yeah no i i don't remember what the last scene we took out was um i know you guys have spoken about the deleted scenes and you know we had freddie playing crazy little thing in the bathtub which where he wrote that and um i was sad because i love the song 39 and yes. and when i found out so basically uh 39 was in the movie at some point in japan yes, right right after top of the pops they did 39 I love that song, yeah. and so um, and, and I guess my question, my l switch to something else, which is, what was the song or two songs that came really close to making it? Besides, uh, well, obviously thirty nine, but was there anything else that you wanted to be in there that you know it just it just doesn't work? Um, wow, I'm trying to think of that. So I, I don't I'm putting you on the spot with new stuff. You are. <laughs> you are. Um, I don't think there was a song that we actually took out. Other than 39, um, we added, like, the party scene um, after Crazy Little Thing, we added uh, Super Freak okay. um, because I felt playing too much Freddy at Freddy's own party was the wrong thing to do. And I, Brian May wanted to go for another Queen song. Um, I think it was Dragon Attack or Dragon Kill. Dragon yeah. Attack. And we, we flipped that. Um, I, I think the addition of, of, of uh, Super... Uh, it's Super Tramp or what? Super Freak. Super Freak. It? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, I think that actually works much better. It just you know tells you where you are in, in the period. Right, right. No, absolutely. Um, you know, we didn't have. I mean, the most um, deleted was 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 Freddie's backstory of when he was yo a kid growing up in Zanzibar and he got sent to boarding school on Monday. We actually shot a young Freddie being sent off to boarding school. And we found early on, even before we previewed the film, is that, you know, Dad says it in the lunch, in the lunch that they have with Brian and Roger, the birthday lunch, and Dad says we were sent from Zanzibar. And we sent him because we couldn't control him to, to, Mum, to uh, Mumbai. And so we, we took that out, and it felt, again, it, that we were slowing the movie down. Uh, will, for fans that, because listen, everyone who sees this movie is going to love the Live Aid stuff. Uh, will we see the full set before the Blu-ray? Is there like any sort of special <laughs> thing, or yeah, is it put it on now? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, but no, I'm just curious. But will fans ever get to see like the full set? Um, I hope they do. We're talking to the studio about it now. I think it warrants it. I really do. So, so I think we will. I'm not sure about before the Blu-ray comes out, but I'm. We're talking, as I say, we're kind of negotiating that now. now I, I, I personally, and I've, I've said it to you before, I could take a five-hour version of this movie. You know, I'm, I'm, but what, uh, I really could. Uh, but one of the things I really love about the film also is the creation of the music. When they're in the studio 
recording, Bohemian, you know, when, the, when they're working as a team, if you will, to come up with these songs, it's so well shot and edited and it has this fun energy and the camaraderie. Um, talk a little bit about, you know, coming up with that stuff and, you know, did, was Brian telling you stories? Was it, you know, how the origin of these moments? Yeah, I mean, again, this is why the film took so long to get made because when you're making um, a film of someone's life story, let alone four guys and everyone else in the film is real, you have to carve it out for a film running time, a two, two and a half hour running time. And so there's so much of their lives that we would literally, Dennis and I would sit in rooms for weeks and weeks and weeks and map out the story we wanted to tell. And we always wanted to tell an audience how they actually made these songs. You know, Rockfield Farm is a place they went off to record A Night at the Opera. And then it was talking to Anthony McCartan about how we, we turn that into a cinematic experience. And it takes a long time to get that right. In fact, we were prepping this movie with Dexter Fletcher about five and a half years ago, and I just woke up one morning and, and got cold feet over the script. I said, it's not ready. And, you know, you get one shot at this. You can't redo it. I mean, there's movies I've done that I'd love to redo again. You just, you just got to get it right or think you at least to think yourselves you've got it right. You never really know. Um, but it was always about, again, celebrating Queen, continuing – Freddie's legacy to a whole new generation who don't know who he is and don't know who Queen are, and showing how they really made these iconic songs happen. Uh, I'm, I'm going to bring up something that uh, could be touchy, but hopefully it won't be. Uh, every movie, no matter, that's based on real people, has to make changes to tell the story, to dramatize moments. And whether it be La Bamba, Amadeus, First Man, you name the movie, it makes changes. I know, like, the this movie obviously takes liberties with certain moments. But I don't have a problem with it, and I am it, the biggest Queen fan, because I know it's t it's making a movie. But I have noticed online for t this particular film, it's being, I think, unfairly treated in terms of certain moments being dramatic license. How are you sort of taking it um, in terms of, because ha have you noticed that, that certain yeah. people are like, and, and I just, I mean, I think we've all seen movies and, m you know, it's not a documentary, it's a movie. That, that's what you have to go through with the real guys. You know, when you get the life rights to these guys, I mean, uh, me as a producer, I feel that burden to deliver to them. And also they have a point of view of what they're coming from. And Brian and Roger, um, from day one, I put it into their heads that we're not making a documentary. They made The Great Pretender, fantastic documentary. They made three or four documentaries on Queen and Freddie. And that we can take liberties. Um, in fact, I showed, I screened Brian May a very early cut of a film I was involved with, Argo. And he saw that film. We watched it in a theater together in London. And then I told him the real story of what happened. And I said, you see the difference? <laughs> you know. Right. And again, I had to get his head around. It was okay to move dates around, to, to not be, you know, completely to history. And a, and a theatrical audience will forgive us if they're entertained and enjoy the picture. If they don't, it doesn't matter. So when I see these critics and I see, what is it, 58% on Rotten Tomatoes or something, not as if I watch a lot, <laughs> <laughs> not as if I'm looking a lot, you know, I, I, I kind of want to comment on it. You know, we made a, again, I set out to make a crowd-pleasing PG-13 film about Freddie Mercury and Queen and their lives and celebrating their music. And a lot of the critics are on my back right now because it's not edgy enough, it's not dark enough. I d I'm not sure what they want out of this. Um, and, you know, it was very tough to even carve this story out. I mean, even now, when I look at it myself personally and I see the rise of the band happen so quick and I go, what, what could we have done to make it a little slower? Because they become queen and all of a sudden they're on their way on their North American tour. And so even now at night, I wrestle with, with their ways where we could slow down the rise a little bit more and not make them so successful so quick. But you're always second guessing. And I don't think when you make a film about these iconic performers, and especially this film, because it has been under the microscope for so long with so many you know, it, different permutations of who's playing Freddy, who's doing what, who controls the film, um, that you kind of, you, you take it as if, you just kind of want to, I want to call these guys and talk to them through it and ask them what film are they, 
what are you critiquing? Are you critiquing a film that would go on Netflix nowadays? Right? Because let's face it, a dark R-rated version wouldn't have a studio in front of it and wouldn't be a theatrical worldwide release. It wouldn't be in IMAX. It would be on Netflix. Right? So that's the world we live in today. And for me, I had two streaming companies that offered me the best financial deal I've ever had on any film to take this streaming. And I couldn't do it. And of course, my lawyer and business manager is pushing me to take those <laughs> deals, take those deals. And I said, Fre Freddie invented playing to the masses to 350,000 people. What he did and does through his music is bring people together. No matter who you're sitting next to, what race you are, what your beliefs are, what your political beliefs are, you can come into this theater, watch this film, and clap along and stump your feet along with and talk and hopefully hug the person you're next to. That's what Freddie wanted out of his concerts, and I wanted to bring a little piece of that to the cinema. Yeah, I, first of all, I say congratulations with all sincerity because you did deliver what you set out to make, and it is a crowd-pleasing, entertaining, fun movie, which also, I spoke to someone who saw it who had a nine-year-old, and they were telling me how much they enjoyed it because it, you, shy, you don't shy away from certain elements of his life, and he was, he was telling me, he was having a conversation with his kid about things he's never talked about, whether it be AIDS, whether it be sexuality, and this right. film opens those doors. But, but uh, look, you either tell a 10-part Netflix series yeah. or you're making something like this, right. you know? And uh, I don't know, maybe I've, I've put too much of myself in there, but you know what I mean. <laughs> no, uh, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, I, uh, but I do think that this film is, um, uh, I think some people... I think you're right with uh, the the axe to grind, and also maybe people looking for something their version of the Freddie Mercury story. Listen, the numbers. England was always going to be the hardest critic and the hardest audience on this film. They, it's the Queen, and the numbers. You know, we released it in England a week earlier. The numbers coming out of the UK are huge, and if you read online, the audiences that are going to see this in England and what they're saying about the film goes ag exactly against what the critics are saying. And at the end of the day, I'd rather have a film that people worldwide go and see and enjoy than, you know, 90% on Rotten Tomatoes and no one shows up, because I've had that version as well. Yeah, but also, you, you kind of touch on that in the movie, though, too, because, uh, you know, the critics' reactions to Bohemian Rhapsody versus what everyone in this theater thinks of that song. Right, right. Well, it's, it's you know, when, when, when the, the Rotten Tomatoes and, and the critics started talking about a week ago, Brian May just sent me an email and he says, they've never liked us, fuck them. <laughs> 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 Um, <laughs> so that was nice because <laughs> I thought he was going to get on my case about the actual film. So, um, but they haven't. The, the critics have never gotten behind Queen, uh, and you see that with Borat. So it's it's a very similar thing that I feel is going on here. But I feel that the film is just taking off everywhere. I mean, I've never been involved in a film where every place I go, they people are dying to see this picture. Yeah, and uh, I'm hoping it delivers. I think this is the right version. How about you guys think? I think yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things is in real life there was Paul uh, and Paul and Freddie that's a real thing and if you look online you can find a little bit of footage of Paul whispering in Freddie's ear it's out there uh, so talk a little bit about putting Paul in the movie and uh, you know how much you wanted to show and stuff like that right, well you know in every film you've got to have your villain right and Paul was a real villain I mean talking I'd be sitting talking to Brian, Roger, and Jim Beach, and I'd mention Paul French, and their whole body language would change because they hated this guy because they think this guy took Freddie into that dark world and ultimate, you know, took him to where he, he went. And so they, they would literally go off about how, how he manipulated not just Freddie but tried to mani mani manipulate everyone around him, constantly, constantly doing it. And Freddie was at a point of his life where he just wouldn't look here, Brian would sit him down and tell him about where French was taking him and Freddie didn't want to hear it. And I, you know, it happens. I mean, it, it sounds cliche, but it happens to a lot of these guys. No, completely. Uh, how much of Paul did you want to put in the film? You know what I mean? Was his relationship, was it ever different? Was it, you know? There was a little bit more of Paul than it's in the final picture, but it, we found it was, as Freddie said, it's too villainous, too, s too soon. And, and so we kind of cut back on him a little bit um, because I felt that the audience gets it, and it's so rewarding at the end when Freddie kicks him out in Munich um, that I felt it was satisfying enough rather than having too much of the 
of, of the Krenta story. And again, it was always finding this balance, um, finding the balance of Mary Austin and Freddie's relationship. You know, I know that, uh, especially in this country and around the world, people don't know who Mary Austin was. When we put that first trailer out, everyone's saying, you're degaying Freddie Mercury, and who is this woman in his life? You know, um, so it was always about finding that balance, finding the balance of him being, you know, in with, with Jim Hutton, him partying, him coming back to the band, breaking up and going to Germany and doing his solo album. So there was a lot to pull into a two hour and 15 minute film. There was a lot of information. And again, it's, it's, it's all about making choices and picking and choosing the story you want to tell. I'm almost out of time with you, but I always open it up to the audience for questions, and I'm sure there's a few in here. Um, we're going to do what we call lightning round, hopefully, which is uh, I can try to work in a few things before, um, but uh, let's start there. subject but he he was so you know him and I met on a general meeting I'd never met him before and he came into my office and we were talking about films and we have a we know of some people in common and I have these record albums on my desk of Queen and he said I guess that movie's taken and I said well not yet and he says well he goes I'd be interested but you'd never find Freddie you could never find someone to play Freddie and I said well watch this and I showed him the Rami Malik iPhone, he just went, oh my God, can I make that movie with you? And I, again, I'd never met him before. I didn't know anything about him. I'm not an X-Men type of guy, so I hadn't seen X-Men, but I'd sure. seen, obviously, Usual Suspects and Val Three. And next thing you know, he dropped whatever he was doing, and he became obsessed and was texting me literally every 10 minutes stories that he had just read about Freddie and how this would be great and how that would be great. And he became passionate overnight for it. And... You know, he had a home at 20th Century Fox, and we went into Fox, and he pitched the hell out of this story to all the studio heads. And I, I mean, I sat there, wow, I'd never heard a pitch like that. And that's how we got the movie greenlit. So I will always be thankful to him for that. And how about that press conference? That's Brian Singer sitting there. That's not Freddie. Why isn't he shooting it? When, y when you see a lot of directors shooting certain scenes, when I was doing Aviator, I would look at the scene with Howard Hughes in the screening room, and then I'd look at Marty and look back at <laughs> the screen and look at Marty and go, wait, I could feel the connection <laughs> in certain scenes. And, and this is the same with Brian. Right. Listen, I talk to him. We text, we text each other, and his personal life is his personal life. And, you know, he's a guy that has, that has trouble focusing more on more than one thing in his life, and a lot of directors do that. When you do Scorsese films, you have to take over his personal life because he can only focus on directing the film. And Brian's very similar, and he had a very sick mom, and she was tech he was on the phone 15 times a day. Right, and he, he had to go off and do what he had to do, but we needed to finish the film. Completely. Let's move on to the next subject right there. Uh, I don't know if everyone could hear, how easy was it to get Mike Myers in the film? Mike's been a good friend for a long time, and we've spoken about this project for years. Obviously, his relationship with Queen, um, and we knew that, you know, and Queen knows, but Queen's popularity was really through Wayne's World here and that moment. And so I would say to Mike, we're going to write a role for you to come and play and say that one line. I just need you to say that line. And he was like, great, tell me when to show up. And he was just a trooper to do that. Is it true that he, he said yes to this without seeing the script? <laughs> it was. Because, <laughs> yeah, because we were still writing and going through it. And again, I would talk to him about the, the kind of character I want him to play. Um, and he did say yes to it. And then I sent him the script and just kept my fingers crossed that he was still going to show up. And he called me and he goes, what about if I look like Jeff Lynne from ELO? <laughs> <laughs> and talk with a northern accent. I said, I don't care where you talk from, just come and do this, because I had no money playing. But so 
Um, so he was great. He showed up and did that, and I think it worked perfectly. Completely. Did did anyone? How long did anyone realize it was only in the credits that that was Mike Myers? Right. Because I I've heard that from other people that right. they don't realize it's Mike, right. which is amazing. Right. Um, right. Uh, let me look over here. Uh, question right there. Well, we had all the masters and the stems from Queen, so we wanted to use Freddie as much as possible, but there was some parts of the film we just couldn't use Freddie, and we had to use Mark, and he was a godsend to us. And Queen actually found Mark about five, six years ago, and um, they told me that they found someone that if we need needed to, could come in and help us on the film. Um, I guess he was touring as a Queen extravaganza band, and um, I remember going to, they kicked their tour off on American Idol, so I don't know, 2014 or something, and I remember going to the rehearsal, and Brian May came off the stage and said, that's the ghost of Freddie, that was, because it was so Freddie. In fact, we were doing pre-records at Abbey Road Studios, and Brian May walked in, and we sat down and listened to two, two versions of, um, I think it was Bohemian Rhapsody, and he wasn't sure which one was Freddie and which one was Mark. You know, and then Rami, you know, Rami said, I mean, that meeting in my office, he goes, I don't sing. <laughs> and I said, I'm not looking for a performer. I'm not looking for a singer. I'm looking for an actor. No one sings like Freddie Mercury other than Mark. So, we, so, so I said, don't worry about the singing. We'll take care of that later. Let's worry about your performance. Um, but most of it, 99% was Freddie. A little bit of Mark. Like when he's doing bow rap in the farm, that's all Mark would go, obviously, because he didn't have that from Freddie. I was going to say that it's so – I've heard some people say, well, you know, it would be better if Rami sung. And, I, I, and my response is, Freddie Mercury, tell me the other singer that's out voice. Th Yeah, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> tell me <laughs> – I'm like, but tell me the singer that's out there over the last 25 years that sounds remotely like Freddie or – you know what I mean? Like, there is no other singer. No. And uh, um, do you, uh, I'm being, begin, being given the wrap-up signal. Do you want to do one or two more or, yeah, or are you yeah. – because I don't – I want to – one more. One and a half. Right. Uh, okay, wait. Wait, I saw a very high hand. Well, the one that I would lose sleep over was Brian May. Because that, that hair only fits a certain person. And also playing that character and having that voice. And I was sitting... Um, First of all, Susie Figgis did the casting. She, she's been on to film as long as I have because I've she's talked me off of many cliffs about the casting of this movie. But she called me up one day and said, you should meet this guy from Wales. His name's Willem, and I'm going to send him over to you guys, and you guys can meet with him. And I'm not sure why or what happened, but I was sitting talking to someone like this, and I guess he came in and just stood there, and we didn't really see him. And after a while... Well, hang on a minute. And I just said to him, would you like a tea or coffee or something? Sorry for keeping you waiting. And he started going into his Brian May. And my mouth just dropped. I mean, I couldn't believe the mannerisms, the voice, everything was Brian May. And so that, to me, was the big one to cast. Deacon, of course. I mean, they, they all were. But Brian May, is such and plus he's with us. So he's on TV. He's in the newspapers. And so... You know, with Brian, you, you have to get it right or there's no movie. It's quite simple. And, um, you know, the, the biggest, I mean, first of all, the first, the only time in my career where I've been completely petrified is when I screened the movie for Brian and Roger for the first time. It was on a Sunday morning in London. I think it was, last op it was September of this year. And we walked into a screening room and they were like, they would not seen anything cut together. So they were very nervous. <laughs> I was... I was like climbing the walls and I literally got a chair where I could watch Brian and Roger watch the film and I didn't watch the screen once. 
I just watched their reactions to the film the whole time. Did they say to you, um, hey, come on, stop watching us? <laughs> no, th I don't think they knew and I don't think they cared. I think they were so focused. I mean, I always say to these people, it, it, it's not easy. I mean, your life story is going on 6,000 screens around the world, you know? And so I understand how hard it is for them to see that and the memories of everything. The memories of Paul Prenter alone, you know, and everything else. So for me, it was it was about getting their blessing, of course. I needed that. And when the film finished, it went quiet for about 12, 12 minutes, which seemed like two hours. And th they said nothing. They just sat there. And I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> they, they hate it. Like this. And they just got up and they just walked over to me and they just were both in tears and just gave me a big hug and said, we love it. We love it. And uh, that was a big moment. On that note, I'm going to say thank you so much for doing the Q&A and letting us screen thank the movie early. Thank you. Of course. I, re I really mean it. Uh, congratulations. Thank On that you. note, uh, Graham King. Thank you. Um, everyone, I'm glad. So uh, again, thank you to IMAX and 20th Century Fox for letting us screen the movie early. <laughs>